The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this webinar on local government reorganisation. Many of you may be returning guests to these webinars. I'm Ashley Moore, Corporate Communications Manager of SIPFA, and I will be moderating today's discussion. As many of you may already know, this is one of a series of webinars that SIPFA is hosting where we're examining a range of issues for public finance professionals, some directly related to the COVID-19 pandemic and others that predate it. So let's get into it. As you will all be aware, the policy landscape that underpins today's discussion is incredibly complex. With the scrapping of the devolution white paper, many may think that local government reorganisation has been put on the back burner. However, even without the prospect of devolution on the cards, reorganisation is being considered by several local authorities. Today, we'll be taking the opportunity to explore the drivers behind reorganisation, the impact it can have on stakeholders and the practical considerations that must be kept in mind. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I want to remind everyone that we do want this to be an interactive event, and this is an opportunity for you to put your questions and comments forward to our panel for them to respond to and discuss. As is the usual format for these events, you're able to submit a question via the chat box on the GoToWebinar dashboard that you should have on your screen in front of you. Once the presentations have concluded, I will put those questions forward to our speakers. You can submit a question at any time. There is no need to wait until the end of the presentations. So to discuss this topic today, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Joanne Pitt. Uh, many of you will know Jo as SIPBA's local government policy manager. She is an experienced local government advisor with 25 years of public sector experience. Through her work with CFOs across the country, she continues to support local government improvement and reform. So without any further ado, I will endeavour to hand over to Jo. Hello and welcome uh, everybody and thank you very much for your time. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you about the Art of Reorganisation. I've got um, three slides to share with you. Um, so one was on the context, which is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about context and about uh, um, the traditions of local government reorganisation, but it's not going to be a history lesson. So those of you who, uh, uh, who don't, don't, like, don't like history, don't worry about that. So I'm going to move swiftly on to uh, trends and drivers for local government reorganisation, as that's really an important uh, element of the discussion today before I um, hand over to my colleagues for further debate. Um, so essentially, um, if you're looking here, I've got uh, incremental centralisation and context. So they're nice sort of key things for this slide, really. Um, local government reorganisation is inherently incremental. It has not had a huge amount of strategic direction at any time. And this is because it's invariably influenced by the sort of political and economic context within, it, within which it is set. I mean, if you go back to um, sort of the Municipal Corporation uh, Act of 1835, when they set up 178 councils, you can see there the need that uh, Westminster saw for local support, um, but there still was an un uncertain concept about what central and local agenda would look like. Um, as you move forward to sort of the Local Government Act in 1888, we see the transformation of county councils, and they're given the powers that we recognise in many of our county councils and, um, and council structures today. So the ability to raise and levy rates, uh, yeah, license entertainment, many roads, all of those which are very familiar um, to us at the moment. But think about 1888. So we've got in history and economic terms, we've got uh, a growth in population moving in um, to uh, a much more sort of city-based, larger town-based rather than dispersed populations um, that, were, that were previously sort of agricultural based. So you see there that there was a need, and Westminster saw a need, to have a stronger, um, more local uh, set of uh, ruling structures, and that's where you have um, local government. So you can never divorce local government reorganisation from the context in which it's set. Um, the other thing that's really important when you're talking about local government reorganisation is the centralist culture from Westminster. This must never be underestimated. So right back from when reorganisation uh, started, there has always been a concern from Westminster about releasing power um, uh, 
from that central hub to local areas. So local, local areas wanting the power to raise money, make decisions, create um, you know, eco economies that are growing. And those are all the same sort of discussions that we're having at the moment. But we see through time and memorial, the centralization and the culture from Westminster continuing. And there is a, a, a lack of willingness in some cases to ensure that there is that reorganization and there are additional powers being passed through um, it, to local government. And part of that discussion um, is, is, is really important when we talk about reorganization and what it actually means to be reorganized. Um, because reorganization is, is different to sort of a devolved uh, de devolution agenda. Um, through coronavirus, um, we've seen that debate uh, played out in first hand where um, central government is providing grants and requiring local government to administer those um, and that sometimes the, the challenges around that have been quite tense. But local government has managed that and without the local government on the ground delivery of those services, uh, the rollout of some of the support around COVID would not have worked or have been so successful. So it's important when we're looking at reorganisation, we think about context, we think about that centralised culture from Westminster, but we also understand that it is incremental and there hasn't been a sort of one size fits all, which is very much again the case in reorganisation as we'll talk about um, as we go forward. Before I talk about drivers for reorganisation, I just wanted to look at some of the trends for organisations going forward, because it's important that when you're reorganising, you're also looking ahead. It's not just a reaction uh, against something, but we're looking again. This is PMG, and it looks at these six uh, trends for organisations in the future. And a lot of that you can see filtering through uh, from the reorganisation agenda. The work in partnership and the focus on the environment. Loads of organisations also all work in partnership within local government. So that partnership, very strong, and it has been a culture that has been developing uh, over a number of years. Again, that's something that we have in, uh, in abundance within local government. There's that requirement to focus on the environment. Focusing on the environment is a key remit within local government. We see that by many having declared climate change emergencies, and this will increase uh, as demands uh, uh, start, to, um, start to increase during COP26. And we can see that need coming through as part of uh, a, an agenda. There's these two, the next two, which are increased digitalization and automation. I'm going to put together. The increased digitalization has rocketed as we've been through COVID. Everybody has gone online. Um, services that previously were ones you had to call in on have had to transfer to an online system. And that is not going to reduce. So that hand in hand with increased automation needs to be part of the reason for reorganization. There's that increasing engagement with community. So local authorities um, have in the past always engaged with community, perhaps through elected members, perhaps through surveys. But there is that drive um, and a trend that clients and customers will want to see that. So there's a requirement to be transparent and to be seen engaging. That's on social media as well as in person. And finally, an increasingly skilled workforce to deliver all of those services that we have within local government. So they're the sort of trends, the rising trends that we need to match for uh, reorganization when we're looking at that. And what about the drivers? What's making individuals uh, and, and organisations look towards reorganisation as uh, a solution to some of the challenges that are out there at the moment? We've got seven here. 
and I'm not going to take the first one, I'm going to leave the first one to last actually. Um, it should be about improved delivery of service. If we're just about cutting costs, that's not going to be a message that sits well with organisations. Also, the cutting of costs, uh, which is a driver, you know, the intention for many is to reduce the cost of their service, um, has a number of challenges. Academically, there's been very little clear uh, work done on exactly how much cost savings are done through reorganisation because it becomes quite difficult to work out exactly where those cost savings lie. So it's important that those two sit uh, alongside each other. So although we have cost savings, we also improve delivery of service. And in fact, perhaps we could start to think about measuring outcome as a more effective way of seeing the success of reorganisation rather than sort of whether it's saved money in the, sh in the short term, which could perhaps not work. Then you've got um, increasing capacity. So with increasing capacity um, where two organisations join, you've got the ability, you've got more staff, you've got more flexibility, you've got more capacity in skills as well as individual resources. So that is a driver that allows the organisation to be more resilient and to weather storms and the new challenges. So that's really important. And that, that increased capacity links back to that trend of skilled staff. So we need to have that. Two others I'm going to link together for drivers are financial resilience and reduced risk. Now, financial resilience isn't the same as cost savings. Uh, financial resilience is all about financial stability in the longer term. So you need to link that with a combination of income, capital, spend, reserves, and linking it all together to ensure that there is a more resilient organisation um, after the reorganisation has occurred than prior to it. So that requires financial management and good governance as well to sit around that. And as part of that good governance, we would hope that there was a reduction in risk. So as the organisation um, becomes more diverse, then we're able to look at those risks and think about how we can manage those risks in that broader organisation. Um, the risk appetite may be different within organisations. So historically, you need to have a consideration of that um, when you're looking at those drivers because they might take a while to align. And then finally, um, I'm just going to talk about the driver of sort of opportunity power and political voice. As an organisation becomes larger, there is often a desire to raise its political voice so that three organisations together or a single organisation can amplify a political voice that perhaps um, they were not able to um, articulate um, on their own. And that sort of comes with that link of greater opportunities. We see at the moment the desire for um, economic regrowth. The concepts of levelling up have uh, identified a number of funding pots. And so there may very well be a stronger opportunity um, to secure types of funding um, in a new reorganised um, structure as opposed to the original three structure that was the original structure that was on its own. So that amplification of the political voice and that the ability to um, uh, you know, generate more power. I mean, certainly the political voice has happened, if you think about sort of the voice of Andy Burnham over the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, was represented a, lo a sort of local entity um, rather more than a national voice and was amplified quite loudly across the spectrum. So hopefully that's given you a flavour of the importance of context within reorganisation and the importance of both trends and drivers. I'm now going to pass over to uh, my colleagues um, who will take you through, Lisa and Natalie, take you through a more detailed um, look at local government reorganisation. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Joe. 
Uh, our second speaker, as Joe alluded to, is Lisa Quinn, a former local government director of finance and now founder and director of Oak Grove. Lisa built her career in local government over 27 years, up to 2013. She spent two years as Section 151 officer at Macclesfield Borough Council and led the transition from a financial perspective to a, a new unitary authority in 2009, then becoming Section 151 officer for Cheshire East Council. She held this position for four years before moving into the private sector. So we'll now be hearing from someone who's been there done it and lived to tell the tale. Um, so please do keep sending in your questions and I will hand over control to Lisa. Ooh, hang on, having a couple of technical difficulties. Uh, ah, here we go. Great, I will hand over control to Lisa. Lisa, are you able to, is, has the mouse come over to you? Um, not quite yet. Hmm. Okay. Apologies, ladies and gentlemen. I am endeavouring to fix this. Um, there we go. Let's try that. No, it's not working yet. Oh, this is typical. Um, right. Okay. I think for expedience in that case, um, I know many of you will be sick of the phrase, next slide please, but um, I think we may need to, uh, oh, hold on, there we go. Um, Lisa, if I move your slides along for you, and if you let me know when you'd like it to move on to the next slide. That's great. Thank you. Um, well, that's a good introduction, isn't it? Um, but uh, the technology will will work from here on, I'm sure. And um, thanks to uh, Joanne, some, some great insights there on the uh, uh, the drivers and the trends uh, around reorganisation right now uh, and it was a fantastic build up thanks thanks for the introduction because i have been through reorganisation back in 2008-9 and uh, so i'd like to take you through some lessons learned as far as that's concerned next slide please okay so lgr is happening just get on with it that sounds a bit of a blunt statement but uh once the decision is made uh, for, for reorganisation, uh, you really have no choice. Uh, you have to get on with things and you have to really concentrate the, uh, the mind. There's no doubt that uh, the, the build up to reorganisation uh, can be fraught, it can be difficult. Um, and from a personal perspective, uh, not, an easy, not an easy ride. But nevertheless, we're in, this, uh, uh, in, in these roles to, to do a good job and you have to then concentrate the mind, as I've said, and, and move forward. So whatever the driver and the decision-making mechanism, and Joanne's been through that, there are changes uh, over, over the years in terms of the, uh, the drivers for your organisation, but you are likely to less, have less time than, than you would like um, when it comes to implementation. There's no doubt. When I look back to the Cheshire organisation back in 2008-9, by the time the decision was made, we had nine months to deliver, and uh, we would have preferred 12 months and actually um, if given a, a choice you'd, you'd choose to have longer than that. It always seems a, a, a huge and difficult task to, to build new authorities uh, in the space of time that you're given uh, but in the end that no choice uh, situation, a time frame that you cannot control and change uh, then uh, providing you don't end up uh, in a panic situation which none of you do. Uh, you know John's talked about uh, the what you've been through over over the uh, the past years through the austerity measures through different policies and through uh, particularly uh, right now the difficult circumstances for the pandemic so local government is used to getting on with it and, uh, and and moving forward so think about what the future holds for you your team and your authority um, this will be a personal journey uh, depending on your role it will be a journey for you and your teams and um, certainly um, a change uh, from, from the authority uh, perspective. Um, you have to afford time for thinking, thinking ahead and thinking about what that, that, that change means. You may feel like you haven't got that time. Uh, I mean, I've put the, uh, the picture there of the screen <laughs> for a purpose. Uh, sometimes it feels that, uh, you know, that there, there is no time for thinking uh, and it's all about action. But if you afford that time, if you speak to the experts that you're, you're working alongside, uh, both from a finance perspective and from a wider service perspective, um, you will feel better about that implementation. I must advise that do not get lost in the details. This can become overwhelming. Uh, there is much detail to go through, there's no doubt. But if you think clearly and look ahead, 
um, then not everything needs to be tackled uh, right away. Uh, you need to think about the steps that need to be taken for go live from when the new authority comes about, um, or new authorities, I should say. Um, but also, you know, kind of just just uh, think clearly, take time, and speak. Uh, so work with your management team and reporting teams to work out what must be done by day one, critical only. Uh, at the start of uh, implementation, you have done an awful lot of work already. No matter what the mechanism has been in, in the background and how you've got to the position where the decision has been made, an awful lot of thinking and planning has already happened. But when it comes to day one, uh, you really have to set out exactly what is required, critical only, because that's all you will be able to manage. The public just needs to see, uh, you know, the end of uh, one authority and the start of a new authority. The way they need to see that is not see anything at all. It just needs to happen and things need to carry on. Next slide, please. So what does implementation mean for you? I wanted to really focus on the personal uh, aspects of reorganisation. As I said, it, it is a personal journey and it very much depends on, on the role that you have. So it's a really important question as it determines your approach to implementation. So do you welcome the change? Not everybody um, in this situation, and I'm, I'm you know, directing this mainly at finance prof professionals, but it depends where you are uh, in terms of the organisation, the role that you have. If you do welcome the change, then grasp it, run with it and do the best you can uh, with, the, uh, with the resources you've got. If you don't welcome the change, you still have to sort of grasp it and you still have to run with what's required. Um, but really think about what your future holds because you have to kind of think on a personal basis. Do you see yourself working for the new authority? Um, you know, not everybody that goes through reorganisation will, will work for, for one of the new authorities. So what does that mean? What, how do you behave and how do you react to that situation? Uh, what influence can you have on implementation? Uh, depending on your role, you may feel like, well, I, you know, I don't have much control over implementation, but you do. Every individual has something uh, to offer when it comes to implementation. If you're in a position to lead, do you want to lead or, you, or do you feel able to lead? So, you know, the, there's a lot to do and it may be that your position is not one of, of leadership. But if you are in a position to, to, to lead, how are you going to do that? So really think that through. So whatever your thoughts are for the future, you have a duty to fulfill your role. Uh, you know, the finance uh, community has a lot of duty, a lot of uh, kind of uh, responsibility, uh, and a lot of things that have to be uh, done well, transparently and properly. So no matter what the circumstance, no matter what you feel about reorganization, you have a duty to fulfill. And you're a big part of getting the best result for the, for the area that you serve. So you will uh, have an influence and you will make a difference. So there's no doubt that LGR can be a once in a lifetime career opportunity. It was for me. And at the very least, though, it is a catalyst for change. So what does that change mean for you? What do the stars hold for you? Next slide, please. So what does implementation mean for your team? So first of all, I'll, I'll try this at uh, potentially at section 151 officers. I know the audience today will be will be varied. So I was the section 151 officer in this role and there's no doubt you've got significant responsibility for the human impact of LGR. You cannot separate um, the, the mechanics and the need and the governance requirements and the financial arrangements and the asset uh, situation. Uh, you, you cannot uh, just drive forward on that basis. You have to think about the human impact uh, of reorganization and for a section 151 officer you will have a team range of teams on, underneath you uh, and looking to you uh, to, to, to take that lead and uh, you have to think about what the human impact is for for each each person so we've discussed the drivers uh, but there's no getting away from from targeting of corporate savings there's a general tendency that reorganization does bring about the opportunity for central savings and that means in many cases, people. And you have to think about that, communicate it well, look at the reasoning behind that. And as Joanna's pointed out, there are much wider reasons for reorganization, but there's no doubt that the corporate center will, will take some of that, um, that uh, savings position. And you have to think that through. You'll have to balance the care for your team with the reality of reductions. If you're a member of a finance team, so I'm speaking to uh, a finance professional now that's part of a team, it will be a vital part of making sure new authority functions from day one. 
So all of this may feel daunting, but it's not as earth shattering as it sounds. Every person in, 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 in a role, in a finance role, just needs to apply their expertise, what they know, what they do well. You need to think calmly and logically about where you are and your team's responsibilities, uh, how they fit now, how they fit through transition and how they need, are they needed beyond uh, once you go, go live. So it is teamwork, grit and determination that, that ensures success. And I can, I, you know, I speak from experience. I've seen it happen. I've been inspired by how people pull together uh, to, to deliver this, uh, this major change and, and this, you know, kind of emotional change as well. So this is something that you all do well, uh, whatever the circumstance. And certainly back in 2008, nine, we hadn't been through austerity. We hadn't been through uh, a major pandemic. So I do really applaud um, the people who are taking authorities through the organization at this time. Next slide, please. So what does implementation mean for your authority? So most likely you care deeply about your current authority uh, and area that you serve, and that, that is understandable, um, especially when it's that authority is being consigned to history. So that can be a part of the personal resistance to change, there's no doubt. Um, but you can also be a positive influence uh, on ensuring that good practice is not forgotten. So those authorities did damn good things over many, many years, and that can be carried forward. And you can take some of that responsibility to bring that good practice forward. So there's no doubt you may have resistance to change. We, we all do, and we all wish sometimes that uh, things didn't happen and we just want to get on with our usual job. Um, but, um, but, you know, think about that past and how you can take that forward uh, positively. Implementation of LGR means transition from one model of local government to another. So make sure you understand the new model that you are aiming for. So, you know, if you're heading to a unitary authority, I know we have some districts coming together, so it may not be too much of a, a, a tra you know, transformational change, uh, but think about that new model, how it works and your new responsibilities under that new setup. Whatever your position uh, in, in the current authority, you will need to plan for its closure, its legacy for new authority and the new authority requirements. It's what you do well. So this is a partnership uh, and a collaboration. Um, it needs to be a one team approach. Again, I look back to, to my experience and that team approach, that collaboration, understanding each other, understanding our differences uh, from different types of authorities coming together. Um, it goes a long way to, to, to getting success. Next slide, please. Okay, so finally, I'll just look at some, as we are speaking to finance professionals today, I'll, I'll look at finance considerations. I can't go through the detail here. There's, there's much detail. All I can say is that it may feel like time is melting away. Um, so just do what you do best. You strategically plan, you account, you process, you close and you open. Uh, and that's the same uh, whether you're going through normal day to day or whether you're going through reorganization. If you stick to what you know and do well, then you'll get the other side. The funding package, work from headline figures. Do not start with existing detail. Funding packages have changed over the years, there's no doubt, but it's better understood by non-financial practitioners and, and partners if you speak on a headline basis. If you get lost in the detail, you'll lose the audience and you'll, you'll, waste, you'll waste time and resources. So it puts you on a better footing for the new authority and you look ahead with a clear page. You're not replicating or just joining together what was once there. You are creating a new position. In terms of the balance sheet, you may need to disaggregate as well as harmonise. And if I look at the Northamptonshire situation, they certainly had to do that. And we did for the Cheshire position. So work logically through each line of the balance sheet. What does it mean? Does it split uh, easily or do you have to have some form of negotiation around uh, uh, the split? So you may uh, need to identify an honest, honest broker for this purpose. Somebody who hasn't got that uh, future in terms of the authority position, but very much cares about the transition and the implementation and can take a, a balanced and neutral view when it comes to the authorities that are, are going to take things forward. In terms of assets, advise you really not to set up a residual authority when it comes to uh, assets that uh, still need to be resolved beyond day one. Uh, it can be resource heavy and time sapping. Uh, I won't go into the detail of that, but. Uh, that's a strong piece of advice. If disaggregating um, uh, the asset position, 
you can carry over for negotiation. You don't have to have that resolved by day one. If something is a thorny issue, needs more consideration, needs more thought, there's some big assets to deal with here, then take them beyond and, and put more time to it when you have more time and resource to put to it. If just harmonising, do not wait until the new authority. Establish your asset base early. It's not just about geographic location. It's also about uh, where services are delivered from. And that may be skewed when it comes to geography. So really think about location and the way services are being delivered from those assets. In terms of systems, uh, identify harmonisation opportunities early. So looking back at my experience, we had three revenue and benefits uh, systems. Uh, There's no way we could get that into one position for day one, but we could do an awful lot to, to harmonise uh, processes ahead of going going live and that put us in great a great position uh, for day one being business as usual uh, if applicable do not try to, to move to one system for day one you know maybe in some cases you'll have to do some some form of, of readiness uh, but really really try to only do critical uh, matters before that date and also establish if shared services will be a part of the new setup it's not always the case but if they are there is an opportunity for shared services Think ahead as much as you can for that and prepare. From a Cheshire perspective, we set up 32 shared services in three months. We'd have wished for more time, but it was necessary. And that position has been managed forward since. So that takes you through my implementation learning from my, uh, from my past days. Um, so I hope that's uh, helped you just to consider a few of those uh, um, matters. And um, I will hand over to uh, Natalie, obviously through the, uh, the organiser, as she'll take you uh, from day one onwards. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Lisa. Lots of really interesting food for thought there and great to get that perspective from someone who's been there and been through it. Um, as Lisa said, last but not least, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Natalie Abraham. Natalie is the Chief Operating Officer of SIPFA SECO. She is an experienced senior manager in the public sector with a successful track record of designing, managing and implementing complex programmes of change which have delivered significant savings and improved services. As SECO's Chief Operating Officer, Natalie is responsible for ensuring that SECO is continually adding value to its clients and ensuring that they continually develop their capabilities. So I'm very much hoping that the technology is going to work for us this time and I am going to endeavour to hand over control to Natalie. Thank you Ashley, let's take a look. Success! Yes, absolutely. Success, that's brilliant. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at this webinar today. There we go. So SECO is the change management consultancy of SIPFA and we provide support to organisations grappling with complex change through providing capacity to organisations. But prior to being part of the founding team of SECO in 2016, I worked as the senior manager of public sector reform at Cheshire West and Chester Council. Um, and I'd worked at that council since it was formed in 2009. And prior to that, I worked at Chester City Council, which was one of the four organisations which made up the newly formed unitary Cheshire West and Chester in 2009. Oh, let's see, it might be breaking the technology, might have spoken too soon. There we go. OK, so in regard to LGR, I can only really talk from my own personal experience, which I appreciate will not necessarily resonate with all that have gone through LGR. Um, as Lisa said, it is a very challenging time for many professional and personal reasons. And I don't want to in any way dismiss the perspective that this process can push people too much and too far. There certainly is a decision point, I believe, around whether you want to be part of the new as leaving the old behind, the old organisation, culture and working ways. That, to a certain degree, is a big part of the challenge. But for me personally, LGR represented an exciting opportunity. I'd spent the previous five years within internal audit at the City Council. And increasingly, in the lead up to LGR, I'd been supporting change programmes from a risk and control perspective, predominantly front office um, change programmes, particularly in the cash office. It was 2009, so cash was very much still king, as was handwritten cash books and ledgers, and the less said on that, I think, the better. So for me, being involved in LGR, it really was the chance to really start doing the do and get involved in some quite exciting transformational programmes. 
And LGR is a really unique experience to have lived through. So what I'm hoping to do in, over the next few minutes is to share with you some of my biggest takeaways from that process and how, I suppose, as I reflect in my current role, I realise how these key learnings are applicable to any complex and significant change programme that you are likely to be involved in. So my presentation is going to very much focus on the importance of having quick wins to maintain momentum, the clear necessity for harmonisation in an LGR context, and the need and availability of funding to facilitate that, and ultimately the lasting impact on the culture of the new organisation that this initial transformation is likely to have. So to put into context my role, I was not involved in the run up to LGR as Lisa has just spoken about. I was around the people who penned the business cases and so was there to share their delight when their business case won. Um, but for me, it hadn't and didn't feel a very real thing at all until the 1st of April 2009 when the new council went live. And I was sat in a large auditorium with people I did not know being told that we were going to be the best. Now, some, arguably a lot of people in that room scoffed at, scoffed at this. Um, it didn't mean anything to them. But for me personally, it got me excited and interested. Now, in the time we've got today, I can't share with you all the observations that I have about the good, bad and even ugly about some of the activity that obviously went on in and around LGR. But I do absolutely echo Lisa's view that there has to be a conscious decision made to be on board with the new. If you were on board, this was an exciting time, a ride you wanted to be on, and being the best meant taking risks, being decisive, being free, being empowered. And so therefore, the no blame message that ran in parallel to the being the best message powerfully endorsed all of that. But for those who chose not to be on board with the ride or were just pretending being the best meant nothing and the beauty in the simplicity of that messaging and the ambition just simply backfired. Now I was appointed as a transformation manager into a central team that were tasked with working through all the complex change management required post go live. As Lisa quite rightly stated decisions had to be made up in the run up to go live about what was imperative to be done, desirable to be done, and simply not necessary ahead of the new council going live. So my role was then to action the work that wasn't done in advance. Now, as I'm sure you can all appreciate, this was relatively complex work. The programme that I was supported, uh, supporting comprised of cross-cutting aspects such as customer first, Challenges that still exist today for many, such as implementing a single view of your customer, increasing the resolution at first point of contact, all that good and really valid change management stuff. But not just setting up new, migrating from what was for organisations prior. And similarly, back office transactional finance functions were the same. Orders still needed raising, invoices needed paying, but harmonizing for organizations, suppliers, procurement routes, et cetera, just simply was not done overnight. And then there were the service specific aspects, which I can talk in a little more detail about shortly, around how to bring together four organizations, structures, processes, systems, to allow that single council view of all activity. And all this work needed scoping out and prioritising. And a lot of this was complex, time consuming, and again, resources were finite, so it had to be prioritised. So to run in parallel to this more longer term programme, we had to keep momentum and show positive impact from LGR. And as you can imagine or, or know from personal experiences, there are lots of teething challenges. So I also worked on what we called quick wins, but in reality was simply snagging, capturing issues from managers that could easily be addressed by either flushing decisions or clarity through the system, supporting quick operational changes, quick harmonizations, flushing through really kind of operational management issues was imperative. A particular issue I sorted was just an issue around the scheme of delegation um, that meant the right people just needed linking together so that the system would allow for bottlenecks to be unplugged. And whilst none of these actions needed business cases and there was definitely no identifiable cashable benefit from them, these types of activities eased people's working lives. So sorting these th things out 
in turn built confidence around the deliverability of the more complex issues to challenge, such as harmonization. So harmonization was no mean feat and absolutely not a pre-go live critical task. But time was important as the longer services were left as is, the more ingrained they were in the history and the old authorities and not the future. So I work supporting the Director of Planning and Building Control, so a frontline customer facing service. And in this particular example, there were four planning departments to bring together, each of them thinking that they were the best. So back to my earlier point, the longer they were left with their old systems, their old processes, working out with their old office locations, the more entrenched and ultimately resistant they became. So we very much had to sell a dream to get over the whole world. Let's just harmonize on my um, my old council systems and processes and no, no, ours is far better to kind of eradicate all of that nonsense. We had to start afresh and that's what we did. And it was hugely painful. There's no kind of um, fibbing about that. But my goodness, to this day, it absolutely was the best project that I have worked on. Funding requirements were identified early on, so obviously a requirement for a single system, so a procurement exercise. Digitization of all the kind of historic, arguably archaic paper-based systems that were in place, so there was a clear capital ask. And because the council was set up and able to invest to save, this funding was available. So we could actually take the time to design perfect processes that were customer-driven, needs-based, value adding and not bureaucratic. And we could then build the system specifications for the procurement on those ways of working. We could engage with the customer base as a single customer base and start to bring them with us and utilize this process as the burning platform to move to more digital and self-serve ways of working and to enact all the good things that had been too hard and in all likelihood just too out of reach before for the, uh, for the previous district councils. And now when I go on to that council's website, I'm proud that almost 10 years later, you look at the, the system, the digital history, the self-serve elements, and they're fantastic. And that's as a result of the LGR programme. Obviously bringing people with us was key. So getting excitement in the workforce, positivity, buy-in after such a you know, challenging time was hard. But we found real gems in the workforce, created focus groups, staff forums, put in place suggestion box schemes and had two way meaningful conversations and dialogue. Getting the workforce as the experts to design the new ways of working was so important because that kind of approach um, is contagious. The positivity then spreads um, alongside the credibility of actually working together with a change function to harmonize. But I briefly mentioned location and office locations before and clearly with an LGR you're creating a council on a much broader geographical footprint and location and offices I think a, a key contributor to clean, clinging on to the past and the previous ways of working. There's a lot of loyalty in councils and that cannot be underestimated. And in departments where harmonization was maybe not as big a priority as planning, for example, so they were left a little longer, you still very much heard the staff talking as though they worked for the previous organizations. So really, really hard to break that association with the old. But anyway, back to offices. In the example I mentioned with planning, moving everyone to one office was hugely difficult for the staff at the time. But three months post that change, everyone could see the value of one team and being together physically in that space, which sounds really familiar now, I suppose, with what we're grappling with in regards to return to the offices um, post COVID. But just as I digress slightly, beyond just bringing together of teams and single locations, what absolutely prompted the biggest shift in terms of focus on the new, the new aspirations, new policies, new ways of working, basics like going paperless, that kind of thing. The biggest enabler of change wasn't just moving offices or co-locating together, it was moving to new offices, which hadn't been owned by any one of the four councils previously. So no baggage, no old, just new, open space, clean, crisp offices. So I don't lie when I tell you that the culture shift was immediate. So what I would absolutely advocate if funding allows is whatever space becomes the new kind of offices or co-location point. If it can't be new, certainly can't, don't leave it unchanged. If you do, it will make shifting that culture so, so much harder and slower. Okay, so after a slight digression, back to the people, um, and this is a favourite slide of mine around skill, will and fulfil. 
I think we've got something quirky here to get the wording up. There we go. Um, so what behaviours are needed for successful change? So during LGR, we addressed all these points. And I think looking back, this is a key reason why the change was sustainable. We upskill people, not just in their professional role, but in change management. And I don't mean going on Prince2 courses or getting various colour belts in Six Sigma, which are all super worthy, clearly. But no, as a transformation resource, we did not do to people. And this is a philosophy that I also brought to Seco. Change managers are not enforcers, they're enablers. So by facilitating workforces and workshops in the right way, they're both being trained and providing helpful insight and intelligence to future design at the same time. So then the team involved in the planning workshops were suitably equipped to facilitate that same activity throughout the rest of their departments, creating that learning culture and workforce capable of delivering change. And motivation being honest excitement was created from this the funding was there to change people were supported to want to do things differently and they were encouraged to challenge and call things out and obviously whilst hierarchy was clear and understood people were absolutely approachable so that everyone in the organization i believe felt genuinely able to influence and being the best started to feel really real for people and ultimately the council I, I worked with realized that ambition in 2016 which coincidentally was the year i left but they got there eventually which is fantastic um, but finally a change receptive environment was created and to be honest this was set by being committed to that no blame culture that really empowered people and gave them a sense of um, a sense of freedom and combined, I believe, for a lot of people, that skill, will and fulfill was a real element of successful LGR in Cheshire. OK, just conscious of time, so I'm going to speed up slightly. So obviously, whilst looking back, there may well be an element of rose tinted glasses that I'm wearing when I reflect on LGR. But let's face it, I suppose with when we live through something that's traumatic or impactful, we tend to do that, don't we? Um, but there are some really important pointers which for me are applicable to LGR and in all honesty to every single significant and complex change program that you will encounter in your careers. Clear ambition, objective and vision. It's imperative that there's a clear rationale for why you're doing what you're doing. Um, whatever that is, you need to be clear, bold and upfront about it. You absolutely need strong leadership. Without leadership owning it, being consistent with that ambition, you, you have nothing. And it's not just about what someone says. As Lisa said, it's what you do. You get on board and you embody that vision and contribute towards it becoming a reality. Two-way engagement. Don't assume you know everything. Ask the people who do their doing to use their knowledge and insight to design what works best for customers. Do not shirk the funding proper sustainable lasting change is not free to implement often though the business cases for that investor say uh, you know write themselves but absolutely create a learning workforce that will ensure continuous improvement is sustainable and real and and i'll repeat myself but more most importantly no blame work together because the impact is far far more positive than if you don't and thank you for listening i will hand back to ashley now for q a Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Lisa. Now, that was a pretty packed agenda, so let's move on to questions. But first and foremost, let's see if we can get all of our speakers back on the screen. OK, we have Joe, Lisa and Natalie. Fabulous. Great. So questions. Um, do you have an observation that this is really interesting and very relevant to reorganisation in other areas of the public sector, especially in the NHS and the changes from CCGs to ICS? So does anyone have any reflections on what the, I mean, I mean, Joe, do you have any kind of reflections on what you're seeing from a policy standpoint in terms of the, of, of similar things taking place in the health sector? Um, yeah, um, I, I think that from the view of sort of change and, and drivers, I think you're probably out of my slide, you'd probably see uh, very similar trends and um, uh, uh, as part of the NHS delivery. Um, I mean, if you look at the, um, the bill that uh, we're expecting out sort of shortly uh, about integrated care, uh, you see a sort of, a, um, you know, intense partnership working there i mean you know we're, we're looking for the detail on that 
Um, in fact, we've got quite an interesting um, SIPFA document on sort of roads, if I'm wrong, Ashley, but um, about how we think, of, you know, about integration. So, yeah, I think that um, as part of um, as part of those trends, you certainly see partnership. And, um, you know, the drivers, if you think about the driver slide I put up, um, again, you've got, you know, cost saving, which I know everybody has mentioned, you know, particularly, you know, we're going to come out of COVID, you know, I think there's going to be an intense pressure, you know, on all the public sector to make sure, even if we're not, um, you know, it's not cost saving, we're making sure that um, the, the pence in the pound for every public pound we spend is really maximised on our delivery. Great, thank you, Joe. Uh, so next question, Natalie, in your presentation, you talked a lot about getting buy-in from the workforce. Lisa, given that you've kind of done this um, on the ground, what are your kind of reflections on getting buy-in and what the best way of doing that is, particularly with people who are resistant to change? Yes, absolutely. I think um, it's just um, honesty uh, and openness, really. Uh, I think you, you have to be very honest about what is happening and the potential implications. As uh, Natalie pointed out, uh, not everybody can uh, be um, enthusiastic about change uh, around reorganisation. Not everybody sees their future um, in the new authorities. Um, and that, that's difficult to take and that's difficult for individuals to, to deal with. You have to be empathetic uh, to that. You can't enthuse everybody uh, and it can't be a perfect world. So that uh, sort of honesty, personal interaction, listening, uh, and um, you know, trying to speak to as many people as you can, not just in formal situations. We had a lot of, you know, Natalie pointed this out. We had a lot of people in a lot of rooms on a lot of occasions, um, talking about, uh, you know, the whole uh, human resource implication, the whole uh, kind of situation and, and change, uh, the recruitment exercises. Um, in those formal situations, that can feel very uncomfortable. So beyond that, you know, making sure that you you speak to teams individually, um, hear their, their their troubles, but also hear their solutions. Um, not, you know, leaders and managers in these situations will not have all the answers. Many uh, of the answers come from from the teams, from the from the experts uh, out there doing doing the the job. So um, it's 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 not perfect. It's not easy. It is very challenging, uh, but you have to do your best to 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 ha to have that interaction and and take the criticism. You know, uh, take it on the chin. Natalie, do you have any further reflections on that, particularly in scenarios where people might be a bit more resistant to change and not as positive as uh, as, as you were alluding to in your experience? I completely agree with Lisa. I think it's about honesty. And back to that point I made around being really clear around your ambition, what, what you're trying to achieve through this change, and when you will know that you've been successful in realising that change. I think people might not buy into it or it might not resonate with them but at least there's a clear and consistent message uh, around why decisions are being taken. And I think that that's kind of an obligation of the leaders in, in implementing as well, to make sure that they're always checking that the decisions that are being made are consistent with that objective and ambition. Because once decisions start to be slightly disaligned to that, that's when you can lose, lose the workforce. Um, so absolutely, I think consistency is another key thing that you need to make sure is in place when messaging, when making decisions, and ultimately allowing people the ability to have that two-way engagement. Quite often, when we talk about communicating change, it's talking at people, not listening to them. Um, and what we always advocate when working through complex change is um, the importance of language. So words that mean something to you as a leadership team might not be interpreted in that way by the workforce. So early two-way engagement up front to make sure you've got that common language, common understanding of what we mean is also really important. And a lot of this is kind of with hindsight, you can apply it, but I think making sure that you put in place regular checkpoints to kind of just check that you're being consistent, that you're allowing people a route through to feedback their thoughts, feelings and influence decisions is, you know, it's important to maintain that trust between the workforce and the leadership. 
Great, thank you. Sorry, I was having a bit of trouble with my mute button there. Um, another question for Lisa. You were talking a bit about the sense of there being no time or the sense of there being not enough time when trying to get these changes underway. And obviously that's something that can be quite stressful for any professional in these kind of environments. What are your kind of tips for personal professional resilience if you're dealing with these kind of situations? Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, I have to be honest about um, uh, the toll it takes um, individually. Um, when you put the effort in, and you care about the outcome, uh, then you know you probably worked too many hours, and you you probably put effort in that's uh, above and beyond that you couldn't continue, you know, forever. Um, but uh, as I said, when it comes to um, the team that work for you and the, the, and the teams that work for them, um, then it's remembering that everybody uh, is going through uh, the, the, this situation. So I think the more you listen to people, the more you speak to people and share things, you know, share, share the experience. There's a lot of positives. There's a lot of inspiration comes out of uh, the, these kind of changes. But when, when it's hard, when it's difficult and it's challenging and somebody's had a really bad time telling a member of their staff that, you know, um, you know, the, that you know they won't be part of the new authority or they're not getting the role that they would have loved to have, uh, to, to have got, um, that they're able to share that, that, that sort of pain and experience um you know so it's it really is a communication exercise massive communication exercise uh share what you're going through um you know to a certain extent as a leader and a manager it's a bit tough you know you're in that role uh you're expected to 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 take on board that uh, uh that effort and that that requirement um be a bit of a buffer um you know when it comes to uh, protecting your teams um but if you're open and honest about you know when it is painful when it is difficult and challenging then everybody feels like they're being, you know, listened to, and and, and it is a shared experience. There's a lot of positives as well. I must say. <laughs> Great, thank you, Lisa. And um, I'm conscious of time, but I think this last question might be quite a good one to end one, to end on and to get reflections from all three of you, because all of you throughout your presentations touched on the notion of partnership working in one way or another. So, what would you say are your views on developing productive and collaborative partnerships and relationships whilst you're going through local government reorganisations? So, I mean, Lisa, Natalie, if you guys can speak to the experience um, within the authority, and maybe Joe can speak to the sort of partnership working in the wider sector and across government. Um, Joe, should we start with you, given that might be quite a nice scene setter for what Lisa and Natalie have to add? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think sort of, um, for me, I think when you're in partnership working, the first thing you need to do is there needs to be trust and respect um, uh, across that partnership and a very clear understanding of the goals and objectives that they are, are intending to, um, to achieve. So you know what your decision, uh, you know, where your direction of travel is, that, that that is clearly stipulated. You understand, so I suppose it's similar to a good governance really. You understand people's roles and responsibilities within, within that partnership. And um, it is a transparent um, uh, sort of environment in which people are, are, are working. And that's a really good and important foundation for any partnership, irrespective of whether it's specifically local um, government reorganisation. But I think I would say a clear understanding of, of goals, good communication and a sort of transparent environment. Great. Lisa or Natalie, would one of you like to come in with your thoughts on the best ways of establishing productive relationships? Yeah, I mean, I must admit, it's, it's it's not easy to think about the, the the partnerships that you want to create when you're actually in the mix of you know uh, transition and then and then implementation. If you can, though, uh, you could you know start to build some lasting relationships. We're going to think about outside here because I've talked a lot about the personal experience uh, and the change within. Um, but uh, you know, from a, a the, the politician's perspective. Um, a lot of talk outside, you know, talk with uh, business, the business sector, community sector, um, and general public. Um, to, to a certain extent, the general public, as I said, will just want you to carry on, you know, as long as you know services are delivered from day one. You know, the model isn't uh, much of an issue for them. But for, for partners, um, and certainly, you know, I was looking at uh, partnering with uh, the education sector uh, in the area, um, looking at how uh, those discussions could could happen beyond. Uh, day one, and um, just just looking ahead up to to some of the interesting um, and uh, sort of ambitious things that could be done as a as a new authority. But I must admit, it, it's 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 difficult in the run up to day one. You really really are focused on 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 the must dos. 
Um, but uh, you, you know, beyond day one, really pick that up as quickly as possible because the, the partnership and collaboration that you take forward is really important. Right, Natalie, any concluding thoughts on that question? Yeah, I absolutely agree with both, both what Joe and Lisa have said. And I suppose just to bring it back to that internal coming together of, of organisations that are previously separately separate, I think it is important to celebrate the successes of the old organisations when forming the new. And whilst not strictly under the guise of partnerships, but absolutely to help that cultural shift from old to new is to, is to say goodbye to the old organisations and celebrate what they achieved um, so that that is recognised and part of then the shared history that goes forward and is created from the new organisation. So that would just be my additional thoughts on, on looking inwards. Thank you, Ashley. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, so I'm afraid that's where we have to wrap up for today. So thank you very much to all of our speakers for joining us. This webinar will shortly be available on our YouTube channel. So please do subscribe to the SIP for YouTube to watch it back or share with colleagues, as well as for access to all of our previous and future free webinars. We hope you found today's discussion interesting and informative, and we hope you'll join us again for another webinar very soon. Bye for now. Thank you.